Welcome to Chapter 6, Part 2. In this part, we're going to talk about culture media, obtaining peer cultures, preserving bacterial cultures, and growth of bacterial cultures. Now on to culture media. Now some of this we will have talked about in lab, but I'm going to go over it uh, again because repetition is good. The more times you hear something, the more likely you are to remember it. So we're going to talk about chemically defined media versus non-chemically defined media complex media. We're going to talk about anagrowth, anaerobic growth media and methods, special culture techniques, selective and differential media, and enrichment media. Here I've got two different recipes for media. Okay. Now you'll notice this one has things like glucose, ammonium, phosphate, monobasic, sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate, potassium phosphate, dibasic water. Now if you were reading this on the label of your cereal, you would probably be going, oh, I'm not going to eat that. There's all these chemicals. Whereas over here, you'll see peptone, you, you know, partially digest protein, beef extract, sodium chloride. That's all, ooh, yes, so I've got protein, and yes, I'm more likely to eat that. This is organic. Um, actually, <laughs> well, enough about that and uh, my opinions on whether something is healthy or not. Um, if you have this sort of thing where you know exactly what's in it and you know its chemical structure and you know how much of it is in it, we call this a defined media. Okay. This one is a complex media because we have peptone, we have beef extract. We don't know exactly what's in the peptone or the beef extract. It just depends upon what the cow was eating before it was slaughtered. Okay. And if you toss in yeast extract, same thing. It depends upon what the yeast was eating before it was extracted. Now, defined media, we're not going to be using any defined media in lab. Um, defined media is used in very controlled experiments where you're looking to see exactly what the organism needs. If I tweak this, will this gene turn on? That sort of thing. Complex media, we have a tendency to use that. Um, when we're not sure, one, what the organism needs, or if we have extremely fastidious or picky organisms that have high requirements. Okay. So in our lab, we're going to be using complex media. And in most clinical labs, where they're trying to isolate the organism that is causing the illness, that would be a complex media. Let's talk about reducing media again. This is media that we use to grow organisms that can't survive in the presence of oxygen. So we either use reducing media that takes oxygen and combines it with hydrogen and makes water out of it, which is safe for all organisms, or we put them in a situation where we control what gases they're exposed to. So over here is what's called an anaerobe jar. So we put our plates in that we have our potential anaerobes growing in. We've got a catalyst, just like your catalytic converter in your car, and we put a packet in. When it, you combine the contents of the packet with the, uh, the catalyst in the top, then it takes the oxygen in the inside of the jar and converts it to water. And the organisms are happy, unless they're extremely sensitive. If they are killed by even the slightest amount, of exposure to oxygen, then they're going to die. So we have what are called anaerobe chambers where we pipe in the oxygen or CO2 or nitrogen or hydrogen or whatever the organism needs. Now, we're not going to waste the time and space in an anaerobe chamber on organisms that aren't extremely sensitive to oxygen. So your extremely sensitive obligate anaerobes are growing in there. We also use them for microaerophiles so we can control exactly what they need to have. And this guy looks quite comfortable, but if you're short like me, uh, my arms were way too far apart personally when I worked in those. Now you'll notice when I was talking about the anaerobe chamber that I mentioned pumping in CO2. Some organisms needed a fairly high concentration of CO2. And not for fixing CO2, as you would expect. Now there are organisms that just need a lot of CO2. They're used to living around organisms that are producing a lot of CO2 or in environments that have a lot of CO2. And we call these capnophiles. Now other organisms need live media. 
they can't be grown in dead media like what we've been using in the lab. So you either have to feed them cells that we're growing independently. Viruses are a prime example of this. Viruses have to be grown in a live cell. So traditionally, when you have to grow something in a live media, we go with some sort of rodent. Uh, there's a cute little ground squirrel uh, that you would grow bubonic plague in. It doesn't like to grow on non-live media very well. Um, like I said, you can grow individual cells. We call this cell culture or tissue culture. Tissue culture isn't real terribly accurate. But we grow viruses in this. Let's talk about biosafety levels because this is where we hit it in the book. We have different government levels that are set up according to what you can safely culture in your lab. So our lab is a biosafety level one. We're not working with anything that's a real strong pathogen. In fact, most of the time we're working with non-pathogens and the pathogens that we do work with are only opportunistic pathogens. So the average person with the average immune system is not going to get sick from it. BL1. BL2 uh, you're working with organisms that are a little more pathogenic, um, but you can still work with them um, either bench top or in a biosafety hood. Uh, we have a chemical fume hood in the lab. Biosafety hoods look just like that. They're just a little bit different. And from there, we go to biosafety level three. This is where you're working with organisms that are pathogenic, but we have a vaccine for it or they're not spread airborne. That's biosafety level three. Biosafety level four, this is the hot zone. That's where we not only use biosafety hoods, but we put you in a spacesuit and pump the air into you. That's where we work with organisms that are extremely pathogenic, are generally fatal 100% of the time. That's an exaggeration or we don't have a vaccine for it. So Ebola, some bio warfare agents are dealt with in a biosafety level four. Um, I used to think that would be cool to work in a biosafety level four, but having worked with a respirator once, you know, being in those spacesuits might not be all that fun. Let's talk about selective and differential media. We will be working with selective and differential media in the lab. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Okay, selective media is media that kills one type of organism and favors another type of organism. Differential media shows you the difference between one type of organism and another. Usually we combine the two, like in this example. So let's talk about why we would want selective media. I'm working in a clinical lab and somebody sends me a sample of diarrhea. Now, I know there's about a handful of organisms that cause most diarrhea in humans. So, I want to get rid of the hundreds of organisms, the hundreds of species of bacteria that generally are minding their own business and they're not found in diarrhea samples. So, I put it on a my sample of diarrhea onto a selective media that will kill off most of the organisms that are not causing a problem. I'm selecting for those organisms that I know are going to cause diarrhea. Then for the differential, some of the organisms that cause diarrhea will ferment lactose. Now remember from fermentation, what's the end product of fermentation? Either an acid or an alcohol. Now, thank goodness we don't have bacteria that produce alcohol in our intestines, otherwise we would spontaneously get drunk when you eat a donut. You've got organisms that say ferment lactose, they produce an acid, so we put an indicator in that changes from a nice red when you're at a neutral pH and you turn to a yellow when you get to an acidic pH. Now for this particular media that I have a picture of because it turned out exceptionally well, let's talk about a different type of infection. Suppose I've got a patient that has a skin lesion that's not healing. So we're worried that this might be Staphylococcus aureus, um, specifically uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. And so I take a sample from the skin and I put it onto this media. Now this media is specific for skin bacteria 
Okay, because I've added a fair amount of salt in, 7% salt. So I'm looking for osmotolerant organisms, those that are halotolerant, which skin bacteria are. Now everybody has a little bit of intestinal bacteria on their hands, especially if you don't wash your hands well enough. That's probably not going to be causing the skin lesion, especially if I'm worried about MRSA. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on here, and uh, in this situation, my intestinal bacteria isn't happy at all. It's not growing nearly as well as these two other organisms. So I can safely say that these two are skin bacteria, bacteria that have evolved to live on human skin. Now, one of them is fermenting the sugar. It's producing acid. It's turning the pH indicator yellow. This one is not. It's living off of the proteins in the media. Now I know that Staph aureus will ferment mannitol and that's the only carbohydrate that we have in this particular media. So I can say, oh, so this one over here is Staph aureus, this one is not probably Staph epi. And this is an example of how we use a selectively differential media to uh, select for just the organisms we're interested in and then tell us something about the organism afterwards. At this point I feel obligated to tell you that I really didn't take a clinical sample and streak it onto this plate. Uh, no, I was using three different pure cultures for demonstration purposes, so I don't want you to think that a clinical sample is going to look like this plate. Now let's talk about enrichment media. Enrichment media can be confused with selective media. Um, but let me explain what enrichment media is and then I'll go over the difference between what uh, the difference between enrichment media and selective media. Now suppose I want to isolate an organism that just loves to eat crude oil. We've had a lot of oil well spills recently. You can see why I'd want an organism that would just chew up that oil and get rid of it out of the environment. So what I would do is I would go to an oil field uh, where there's been oil just routinely spilled over the years and I'm going to collect a sample of the soil and I'm going to take that back to my lab and I'm going to put that in a petri dish. Now I'm also going to add crude oil. Okay, I'm enriching for what I want my organisms to eat. Now microbes that don't particularly like crude oil are not going to be enriched by this. Okay. The ones that like crude oil are going to outcompete them. They're going to outgrow them. So that when I take a sample from my first plate, put it on a second plate that has more crude oil, I'm going to continue to favor the organisms that I want to grow by giving them what I want them to destroy, what I want them to eat. Now, as I said, this sounds similar to selective media. But with selective media, we are actively trying to kill some organisms. With enrichment media, we're trying to promote the growth of the organisms that we want. We're trying to get them to outcompete the other organisms in the sample without actively killing the other organisms in the sample. Let's talk briefly about obtaining pure cultures. You've streaked in lab. You know about taking um, a sample and streaking it for isolation. Here we've got colonies. These colonies have originated from just one bacterium. We've separated them out far enough and we've put them on solid media so that they can't move around so that the single bacterium divides asexually through binary fission so that they're all clones of each other. Now as I said before when we were talking about um, biofilms. Originally we wanted pure cultures because it's very hard to distinguish the characteristics of a sample, characteristics of a bacterium, when you have at least two different kinds. We can see here we've got an organism that produces a red pigment, an organism that produces a yellow pigment, and they may be doing two different things and which will confuse our results. So this is how we get a pure culture streaking is the method that you're most familiar with. We can also obtain um, a pure culture by method of a pore plate. Um, we're not going to go over that I'm in lab. Uh, we're also not going to be talking about it in this presentation, but go ahead and read about it in the textbook. It's quite interesting and it's similar to a streak method. Now once I've achieved my pure culture, I want to preserve it. I've gone to all that work, 
I don't want to have my work wasted. There's two ways that are the most common for preserving bacterial cultures. One of them is deep freezing. We bring them way below their minimum temperature requirements and we basically put them into suspended animation. When we deep freeze bacterial cultures, um, we will put them at uh, very, very cold temperatures, either the temperatures of dry ice or liquid nitrogen, and those bacteria will sit there in suspended animation, just like Buck Rogers. Okay, I just dated myself with that one. But they're going to stay in suspended animation until we bring them out, thaw them, off we go. Now, if we want them to last even longer, we do a process called lyophilization. This is basically freeze drying. We deep freeze the, a broth with our pure culture in it. Then we put that under a vacuum. And that causes the water to go from a solid to a gas without going through the liquid stage. Bet you didn't know that's how we freeze dried stuff. And you're left with a powder of bacteria that have been put into suspended animation and they don't mind the drying process. If we were to go from solid water to liquid water to gaseous water, they would not like that at all. We would turn them into bacterial raisins and they wouldn't like that at all. But with lyophilization, we can preserve bacterial cultures for decades. Some of them have been preserved upwards of 60 years and we put some media, liquid media in and they wake up and they're all ready to go. Now on to growth of bacterial cultures. We're going to talk about bacterial division, generation time, logarithmic representation of bacterial growth, phases of growth, direct measurements, and indirect measurements. Now the things that we've been talking about previous to this what the organism needs as far as temperature and oxygen and uh, growth factors and different things we've learned by monitoring how fast they grow. So we're kind of doing this backwards. We've talked about what they need. Now we're going to talk about how we figured it out. Let's talk about how bacteria divide, okay? how they reproduce. Bacteria, with a very few exceptions, divide asexually. They make clones of themselves. After they've grown for a time and they get to about twice their length, if you're a bacillus, then you divide equally in half this way and you produce two equal sized cells. We call this binary fission. Now some microbes, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, brewer's yeast being a notable exception, will divide asymmetrically they will divide by producing a clone of themselves, but a little blip comes off of the side of the circular shaped yeast. And that little blip gets bigger and bigger and eventually pinches off when it's still smaller. And we can tell that that's the baby cell coming off of the mama cell. We call that budding. Not to be confused with budding in plants. Now, whether you're talking about binary fission or budding, when you have a microbe dividing, we're going to use the example of bacteria because it's easier. Whenever you have a bacterium dividing, you get two. And then those two divide, and you get four. And then those four divide, and you get eight. That's what we're showing here. You start out with one, you get two, and from those two you get four. From those four you get eight. From those eight you get 16. From 16 you get 32. Okay. So through every generation, through every round of cell division, you double your numbers. And if we were to graph that, it would look something like this. We poke along, poke along, poke along, and all of a sudden, woohoo! Okay, this is also why you really shouldn't thaw your chicken on the kitchen counter if you're going to do it for more than an hour. In class, we're going to go over examples of how rapidly large numbers of bacteria can increase to the point of where they will cause violent vomiting. Okay, so thaw your chicken in the refrigerator where you keep the, the temperature below the optimum so that you have longer periods in which the cells divide. So you're lengthening out the generation time. Okay, um, some bacteria in their optimum temperature they have all of the growth requirements that they need, can divide every 20 minutes. That's a very short generation time. Other organisms, 
like the organism that caused tuberculosis, has a longer generation time. They have generation times of more like days. That's also part of why TB is a chronic illness. It progresses very slowly. It evades the immune system. We'll be talking more about TB later. Now as humans, especially scientists, we like to name everything so that when we talk to other people, we have words to describe what we mean. So we have names for the different phases of growth. So let's take an example of an organism that we've just put into a tube of fresh new broth. Okay, um, They generally are not going to divide. They're just going to hang out saying, Ooh, this is a new place. We're not sure what nutrients are there. We don't know what proteins we should make to take advantage of the new nutrients. We're just going to hang out and we're going to figure out where we are. We call this the lag phase. Then after they've figured out what nutrients they have, they've made the proteins that can make use of those nutrients, and they start taking off. They start growing and dividing as fast as they possibly can. We call this the log phase. This fits in with the graph on the previous page where the growth is logarithmic. Okay. Then as food starts to run out and as waste products start to build up, we have equal numbers of bacteria dying as are being generated by binary fission. We call this the stationary phase where the numbers plateau. Okay. Here we have more living cells than we have dead cells. Here we've got equal numbers of live and dead cells. Then as the food starts to run out and the waste products get to toxic levels, thinking about swimming around in your own pee for a long period of time, then we get into death phase. More cells are dying than are being produced by division. Now a lot of organisms that are capable of it will go into a uh, resting phase. They will wait out the period in the hopes that things will get better. Because out in the environment, okay, you have the lag phase. Um, well, let's start over here. We've just had a drought. We've had a long winter. It's been very dry, and the organisms are just sitting it out. They're waiting for better times to come. Then the spring rains come, and there's water, and there's more nutrients, and they've got to kind of uh, get up and stretch and say, okay, things are better. It's time to get going, guys. Okay, you've got to wake up, get your morning coffee. And then we go into the log phase where they're dividing and reproducing as fast as they possibly can. Then we get to high summer. Things are starting to dry out. We haven't had rain for a long time. Things are starting to get bad. They're starting to compete for resources. Then we get into the death phase Okay, as the drought continues and the organisms go back into the resting phase. That would be the phases of growth out in the wild. Now at this point I do want to point out, even though I talked about in death phase, organisms going into a resting phase, going into a waiting phase, uh, that we still have a severe reduction of numbers. We've got more cells dying than are going into a resting phase. Okay, so during death phase we have a reduction in total numbers. And that's going to happen in your test tubes if you leave them sitting in the incubator for too long. Or in the example that I used out in the environment, out in the soil, when the soil starts to dry out, organisms start dying off, but a few are going to survive. Now you're probably wondering how in the world do we figure out the numbers of bacteria, let alone which ones are alive and which ones aren't. So we're going to talk about how we measure bacteria, how we measure the numbers. They're way too small just to eyeball. So let's start with direct measurements. We're going to talk about direct microscopic count, plate counts, filtration, and most probable number method. Now the most direct way to measure numbers of bacteria is by direct microscopic count. We have hemocytometers or other methods where Okay, we've got this uh, piece of glass that has little grooves in it. Those grooves are overfill. And we put a cover slip on top of our sample. And we have this little grid that aids in counting. Now underneath that cover slip and in between the overflow grooves, we'll hold a specific amount of fluid. 
Okay, so we know exactly how much fluid we've got. Then under the microscope, we look at these grids, and we generally count three of these big squares, and we average for the total number of big squares, and we multiply back to the fluid that we know is underneath the cover slip, and we can tell how many cells per mil we have. We always go back to milliliters. That's what we use for our standard uh, measurement is um, cells or cell forming units per milliliter. Now if you're just looking under a microscope it's kind of hard to tell who's alive and who's dead. So we do have some stains that are what we call vital stains. They're taken up by dead cells, they aren't taken up by live cells. So you can tell who's alive and who's dead. Okay, in lab we're going to be doing a plate count method which is where you take a sample and you dilute it. You take just part of the sample, usually we go with one mil into nine mils for a one to ten dilution because that makes it easier. You just have to slide the decimal around. So you keep diluting the sample out, keep diluting the sample out, and you get fewer and fewer colonies. Here we've got a lawn. It's a little patchy, but it's still a lawn. We've got growth all over the plate. Here we've got a little bit less, a little bit less, but we still have colonies running into each other. Here's countable. Each of these colonies, we say, represents a colony forming unit. It can be either caused by one microbe, one bacterium, we hope it's one, but some bacteria like to hang together after they divide staphylococci, TB. They have a tendency to stay together in small groups, so that's why we call it a colony forming unit or CFU. So we count that, we do the math back through our dilutions to figure out how many cells per mil we have. Now in lecture we're going to be doing some practice um, dilution calculations, so don't worry about it too much. Now one of the benefits of the plate count method is we know all of the colonies came from live cells. We've provided them with the conditions that they needed, that the individual cells or clusters of cells grew in the situation. Okay, so we know that they arose from all live cells or cells that managed to stay alive long enough to form a colony. The plate count method is good for when you have a sample that has a large number of bacteria. Now on the other hand, if you have a sample that has very few bacteria, you want to use the filtration method. I used to use this back in my days when I was testing water, both in a bottled water plant and also when I was testing uh, water coming out of dental unit water lines. But what you do is you take this large amount of water or media that you can't put on a plate because the plate can only soak in so much. So what you do is you run your sample through a filter. Okay, a filter has these little microscopic holes. The bacteria are too big to get through the hole, so they get caught on the filter. Then you take the filter and you put it onto the media. The bacteria have access to the nutrients in the media, but they have been removed from whatever they were in before. And the filters generally have these nice grids to aid in counting. Speaking of testing water, another direct measurement is the most probable number method, or MPN. This is where, say, your local water department guy has collected a sample um, of water before it goes into the city water supply. He's not going to rush it back to the lab and do a plate count, which takes a couple of days. Instead, he's going to use this uh, most probable number method, which is much quicker. He takes some of his water sample and he takes 10 mils of undiluted and he puts it into five tubes that have a pH indicator so we know if the organism is fermenting. And we use sugars that coliforms or organisms that come from your colon are in. That's what we're most interested in. And then we dilute it by taking just one mil and then we put it into five tubes and then we put 0.1 mil. And then we take a look and we see how many are positive after we incubate them a short period of time. Now for the 10 mil in this situation all five of them turned positive. In this situation we had three that were positive and in here we had only one that was positive. Then we go to a chart that somebody has spent many many hours in the lab figuring out what this ratio, this combination of positives means. So we go to the chart, we look for our 531, 
and it tells us that we have a 95% confidence level that we have between 34 and 250 colony forming units per mil or uh, MPN index per 100 mils. Okay. So the reason why we do this is we're looking to make sure that intestinal bacteria are within set government prescribed limits and they can do a real quick test if it exceeds the limits then we issue a boil order quickly rather than waiting a couple of days and running the risk that people are going to get sick in that time. Let's move on to indirect methods of measurement. We're going to talk about turbidity or cloudiness, metabolic activity, and dry weight. Okay, turbidity, we measure how much cloudiness or turbidity we have in a sample. Now, let's look at this situation here. Each of these little cells are going to block light that's coming through the media. If there's a lot of them to the point where your eye can detect this, it becomes turbid that we can actually see. But we have machines that can detect whether light is being blocked okay, from the light source through the media to the meter that reads it. Okay, and we measure this in absorbance or transmission. Okay. So what people have done is they have done direct counts and they've determined how many cells per mil equals how much absorbance. And some of the time they've done it depending upon species because it does vary by species. But we now have charts that tell us how much absorbance correlates to how many cells per mil. Now this is indirect because we're not actually looking at cell numbers. We're using an indirect method of doing this. Okay. Now just for your information, uh, by the time that you can see cloudiness in the broth in the lab, that's a million organisms per mil, 10 to the 6th. By the time you can see a single little pinprick of a colony, that's also a million organisms. That's about the uh, lower limit for what the human eye can detect when you've got something the size of a bacterium. So just because you have clear fluid doesn't mean it's sterile. It just means it's lower than a million organisms per mil. Okay, we're going to talk about metabolic activity and dry weight together. If you are growing microbes in an industrial situation, um, if you're working in a plant that is growing organisms for a medical byproduct, say we've got organisms that are producing human insulin for us, or if you're working in a brewery and you're wanting to produce beer and you want a certain percentage of alcohol, you want a certain percentage of live to dead yeast at certain points of the process, um, you're going to want to gauge their numbers by metabolic activity by how much CO2 they're putting off, how much alcohol is in samples that you pull off, how much insulin is in samples that you pull off, how much O2 they're sucking down. Now this generally happens in what we call fermentation tanks because originally these tanks were designed for making beer and wine, fermentation tanks. We use the same setup when we're making drugs that organisms are producing um, insulin and what have you and we still call them fermentation tanks even though fermentation is not taking place. But because we're doing this on an industrial scale we want to measure their metabolic activity determine where in the process they are. Now for dry weight there are some bacteria that produce antibiotics that are filamentous. They're very much like mold. They're long and stringy and they don't separate out they really hang on to each other and you simply cannot get them separated and when you look at them under the microscope you can't tell where one cell ends and where one begins. So we measure their growth by dry weight. We take a sample and we take a filter that we've weighed, dried. We run the sample through the filter catching all the bacteria or the mold. Okay, We also have mold that produce antibiotics penicillium produces penicillin and then we dry it out to get rid of the water weight and then we wait again and we can tell by the weight how many microbes are there. So after a certain period of time if from the same volume we get twice as much weight the organisms have doubled their mass. 
Well, this is it for chapter six. This may have been an easier chapter for you because we're actually doing some of this stuff in the lab and we're also applying the things that we learned in previous chapters. If this wasn't a terribly easy chapter for you, don't despair. Everybody's different. It's not a problem. That's why we have these recorded lectures. You can go back and listen to them over and over again. If this was an easy chapter, you're probably going, finally, finally, there is hope for this class.